familiar faces. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce our first plenary speaker, Professor Vivi Chari, uh, who's the Paul Frenzel Land Grant Professor of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota. Um, she's also an advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and the founding director of the Heller Hurwitch Institute, uh, one of the founding directors. He finished his PhD in Carnegie Mellon in 1981 and joined Minnesota in 1994 uh, via various appointments, crisscrossing Kellogg's and the Fed Reserve Board at Minneapolis. Uh, he's, he's been the primary advisor to close to 40 uh, PhD students, many who have gone on to become famous macroeconomists. Uh, as a fellow of the Econometric Society and has been on the editorial board of Econometrica, AJ Macro, JEL, Journal of Economic Literature, and many, many top journals. Chari is um, kind of the macroeconomist's macroeconomist. Uh, he's made, uh, the range of his work is mind-boggling. Um, he's made several seminal contributions to modern macro theory and continues to. So he's built a literature on business cycle accounting, optimal fiscal and monetary policy, growth effects of monetary policy, general equilibrium plans of optimal taxation, expectation traps, and the role of commitment in that context, unemployment, to name a few. Um, he's also deeply interested in policy and has been coming back to India quite a bit in the last few years, especially the Reserve Bank of India. And I want to quote something he said to, um, uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives in July 2010. And he said that we have devoted far too little by way of resources to modern macroeconomics. We have far too few people working on modern, modern macroeconomics. We have too few students, and we devote too little in the way of other resources in this area. I would argue that if we want to prevent the next big crisis, the only way to do so is to devote substantially more resources to modern macroeconomics so that we can attract the best minds across the world to the study and development of mainstream macroeconomics. So if you're a graduate student and you're kind of sitting on the fence, um, you should jump onto the macro bandwagon. Um, so he's been here for the last 10 days. He's, he was at the winter school at Delhi School. Um, he spent inordinate amount, amounts of time with students, was flocked uh, by them. I imagine the same thing is going to happen here. Um, so we're very happy to have you, Chari, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chetan, uh, for those unwarrantedly kind remarks. Um, so Arunava reminded me that, uh, that the last time I was at ISI was almost, was 30 years ago, almost exactly to this day, uh, when Devraj was here and Dilip was here and so on, and they were trying to get me to, to, to come here. And so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about, actually, there's probably lots of typos in, in these slides. The, the first typo is on the title. Uh, the title of the paper is Optimal Co uh, Cooperative Taxation in the Global Economy, because I'm going to talk both about the Ramsey tradition and the Merleys tradition. Uh, think about both uh, proportional taxes and nonlinear non tax systems. Um, this is an example of, uh, of, of some work. Happens more often than you might think, where kind of policy questions posed by policymakers lead to what I think is productive research. That happens more often than you might think. So about three years ago, the United States Congress was debating uh, some important changes to uh, taxation, particularly to corporate taxation. And one of the issues that came up was the nature of what's called border adjustment. And uh, Neil Kashkari, who was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, asked uh, me and Wampa Nicolini to uh, brief him on it. So we wrote up something containing confident uh, assertions about the nature of optimal tax systems. And one of the economists at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis challenged us and said, where is this in the literature? And I thought that the, the results I'm going to talk about were so obvious, somebody must have uh, stated them. And I looked, and I couldn't really find it. There's one paper in the AER which uh, I think is in spirit wrong. I'll go into that in some detail. And so 
uh, somewhat reluctantly, I said, time to, to write a paper on this. So a lot of the results that I'm going to talk about are going to sound very familiar. Uh, and it's, this is more a, a, a primer on how you think about optimal policy. OK, so uh, let's, without any further ado, if I can figure out how to move this, that'll help. Do you know how, how I move this? Maybe it's on the right. Yeah, not sure. How do I? It's going to be a little bit of a challenge to try and remember. Ah. OK, great. Forward, backward. OK, great. So we're going to ask a bunch of uh, classic questions in the context of a, 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 an optimal cooperative uh, tax system. So I'm going to imagine that the countries in the world are sitting around a table and they're trying to figure out how to get on the Pareto frontier. The setting is going to be one in which the available instruments for raising revenues for either redistributive purposes or for, to financing, for financing government consumption are necessarily distorting. And so I'm going to ask a bunch of questions about, like the th following three. In that kind of setting, do we still think that you should have free trade in goods and services? Is, that's a, I think about that as static free trade. In, within the period, so to speak. And then there's a notion of intertemporal free trade, which corresponds to uh, capital mobility. Is intertemporal free trade optimal? And then are border adjustments desirable? And I'll tell you what those are. And the answer to all three of those questions, just in case I don't get to the end, the, the answer to all three of those questions is yes. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, Many people, including me, uh, thought before I wrote this, uh, the, the, we, before we wrote, by the way, I should say this is joint work with Wampa Nicolini at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and Torquato de Tela and Pedro Teles from Portugal. Uh, many think that these answers are obvious. There's a well-known paper in the AER that argues the answer is no, and I'll explain what those differences are. There is a, an important literature in international trade uh, Bhagwati, Jagdish Bhagwati and Harry Johnson were pioneers of, in that in the 70s, which argued that in the presence of various kinds of externalities, um, uh, that free trade may not be optimal, it may be optimal to intervene in the flow of goods and services, either over space or across time. Uh, and they're right that if taxes are not chosen optimally, then free trade is not optimal. Instead, if in fact they are chosen in an optimal cooperative fashion, free trade is in fact optimal. Uh, border adjustments are situations in which the, the basis, especially think about value added taxes. Uh, there's an issue about how what's the base on which you levy taxes like value added taxes. Do you include uh, exports in the revenues that are used to compute the base? Are you allowed to deduct imports? value imports in the base for calculating taxes. And border adjustments are situations in which export revenues are not included in the base, and import revenues are not included in the base either. So anything that you export, you don't get to, to uh, pay taxes on. Anything you import, you don't get to deduct those from your basis for taxation. Um, public finance economists have generally argued uh, informally that, yes, they are very desirable. There are a bunch of international trade economists dating back to Abba Lerner in the 1930s. So what the hell are you guys quarreling about this stuff? Uh, and I'll, as I'll explain, in, uh, in lots of international trade models, uh, the simplest ones, it's irrelevant. So it's not something we should spend a lot of time or, or political capital trying to figure out whether you should have border adjustments or not. And uh, my bottom line is going to be the public finance economists in this instance, not always. But normally, the trade guys are, are better at this kind of stuff. Uh, but in this particular instance, the public finance economists got it right, and the trade economists missed something important. All right, there are a whole bunch of examples uh, about current policy debates in the European Union, for example. 
There are constant debates about whether we should have tax harmonization. Should you have uniform taxes across uh, all of these countries? And there's an important issue that I'm going to shed some light on is should trade agreements, think about the WTO and other kinds of international trade agreements, should they also have agreements on fiscal policy? And our answer to those questions is going to be no, tax harmonization is not necessarily part of, the, of, of optimal policy. And I'm going to argue that it is, in fact, desirable to couple uh, agreements on, on trade across countries to agreements on, uh, on taxes and other aspects of fiscal policy. A bunch of other questions. Should taxes be based on origin or destination? I'm not really going to talk about these in this presentation, but just to tell you what the paper, this paper is available on, the, uh, uh, on my website or the Minneapolis Fed website. Um, there's a companion paper on revisiting optimal taxation or closed economy, which lots of people have found useful that's either appeared or forthcoming in the Journal of Monetary Economics, uh, which, which are both useful papers. Um, but uh, I'm not really going to talk about that in this presentation. I'll skip over some of the recent literature. All right, that's sort of boring, except when you're talking about your own work. Um, so. I'm going to do a bunch of things to start with. I'm going to start with what's called the Ramsey framework. In the Ramsey framework, just to give you a preview of what the Ramsey framework is. So um, um, Frank Ramsey, the greatest British economist of the first half of the 20th century, uh, not the person you think of, uh, uh, but uh, Frank Ramsey posed what I call the finance minister's problem. So for Ramsey, the, the, uh, the finance minister's problem has two parts. One is that the available set of taxes, tax instruments, is exogenously specified. Second, the defense minister, the education minister, the agriculture minister, all of those guys come up with proposed uh, expenditure plans on each particular type of commodity or each particular type of sector. And the finance minister's job is to raise the revenues to finance that exogenously given vector of expenditures in the least distorting fashion possible. Right? That's the, the finance minister's problem. So that's why we call this the Ramsey approach, following what he did. Uh, there's a precursor to this, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, the finance minister for Louis XIV, who was a tyrant. Uh, not Colbert himself was a tyrant, but the uh, that guy was the other, these guys were, were not exactly people you'd want to be friends with. Uh, or maybe you want to be friends with them. I don't know. Uh, anyway, he described the, the secret of public finance as extracting the most feathers from the, from the geese with the least hissing. Uh, uh, and there's a formal sense in which Ramsey's trying to do that. Least hissing in this context corresponds to least distortion. So I'm going to assume a very rich tax system, taxes that are commonly used uh, worldwide. I'm going to focus on cooperative Ramsey equilibrium. One important thing about public finance is that, that this approach and any other approach yields wedges between marginal rates of substitution and marginal rates of transformation. There's typically not a unique tax system that implements the efficient outcomes, outcomes of the Pareto frontier. There are lots of different tax systems. Uh, and furthermore, in this kind of setup, you need to take a stand on, init on initial policies or promises. I'm going to assume, I'm going to start the world in period zero. There's something magical about period zero. Presumably, period, there was a period minus one and a minus two and a minus three also. And so uh, the stand I'm going to take is that, that people were made in minus one or minus two, were made certain kinds of promises uh, about the value of their wealth. In, in marginal utility terms, and that um, those are objects that the planner cannot, uh, uh, has to respect, right? OK, so to make things concrete, I'm going to consider a very popular uh, model in, in, in trade. It's called the BKK model, Bacchus, Kehoe, Kidlin. But as will become clear, uh, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are generalized to other popular models of trade 
including Eaton Court, um, uh, which is a Ricardian model of trade, and a variety of other models of trade. All right, so what are the objects? There are going to be two countries, but that's, you'll see immediately two. Is not, there's nothing special about two. Uh, each country for now is populated by a stand-in household, a representative agent. Those are the preferences of the stand-in household. And consumption is consumption of the, of the final good. That specific country I in period T, NIT is the amount of, of time allocated to the market. Uh, by residents of country I in period T, and these guys have pretty standard kinds of preferences. These final goods, consumption and so on, are not traded. Uh, that's consistent with the data. That's why the, one of the reasons why the BKK model is so popular. What are traded are intermediate goods. And so I want to think about, let's say, India and the United States. All right? So country one is going to be India. Country two is going to be the United States. Uh, just for concreteness, think of, of, of uh, India as uh, producing, I don't know, software, and the United States as producing airplanes. All right? And for simplicity, those are the only two objects. And so what happens uh, in India is that you can combine capital located in India and labor in India to produce software. And this software can be either used in, in India or it can be used in the United States. What is this stuff used for? Software and airplanes combine to produce a final good, which can be used either for domestic consumption, domestic provision of uh, government consumption, which is a public good, and then domestic investment. And domestic investment leads to capital accumulation in country I. All right, so that's the, that's the basic setup of this environment. And initially, if I just said, suppose that there are no lump sum taxes, what would the efficient outcomes look like? They'd have, um, I've written down a bunch of first order conditions. Uh, not surprisingly, the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and, and leisure in each country has got to be equal to the marginal rate of transformation, which is given by, by this expression. Uh, the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution in consumption must be equal to the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution in, uh, in production, uh, in marginal rate of transformation in production. And furthermore, there are two conditions which basically say that these intermediate goods are used efficiently in the two countries. The marginal rate of, sub, of, of transformation of each one of these goods in these, each one of these countries is equated to the same good in the other country. And also, there's an analog, which is a dynamic production efficiency condition, which, which describes, in this environment, how do you transform um, goods, uh, software today, into airplanes tomorrow? Well, you can uh, produce more software, use it to accumulate more capital, and then use it to purchase airplanes from the other country. So those are the dynamic production efficiency conditions. I don't expect you to, to know where they come from, but it's, it's pretty straightforward algebra. Nothing particularly surprising. Now let me turn to the focus of the analysis, which is what sort of taxes do I have? I'm going to have proportional taxes on consumption, final consumption in each country, taxes on labor income. Because I'm interested in how much you should interfere with trade, I'm going to allow for taxes on imports and exports. I'm also going to allow for a tax on initial wealth. And then I'm going to allow the governments in each one of these countries to make transfers to each other in period zero without loss of generality. Because I'm basically going to look at complete markets. Um, uh, uh, you can have continuing transfers, or you can have an upfront period zero transfer. Those are equivalent. We can interpret those transfers as relabeling initial claims that Indian citizens have uh, in terms of American assets and American citizens have in terms of Indian assets. So you can think of it as changing the period zero exchange rate in such a way as to, to uh, relabel those initial claims. A competitive equilibrium in this context, so I'm going to uh, skip over some of the details in the interest of time. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, focus on, on, on private allocations. Uh, as thinking about those as coming out of a competitive equilibrium. Uh, so competitive equilibrium is a bunch of allocations. 
con vector of consumption, one in each period, one in, in each country, time allocated to the market, the intermediate goods that are produced in each one of these countries, the uh, prices of um, both the uh, 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 final good, the intermediate goods, wage rate, and then there's an intertemporal price, and policies, which consist of these taxes on consumption, uh, labor, and, and, and so on, and initial transfers, which, sa which satisfy the following properties. Households solve their problem, maximize utility subject to their budget constraint. Firms maximize uh, profits, the present discounted value of profits. The government budget constraint is satisfied and market cl market's clear. In particular, this is where the intertemporal prices show up. In particular, um, the, this is the standard balance of payments condition, which says essentially the present discounted value of net exports must be equal to the value of initial claims net of any transfers that happen uh, in period zero. Right? All this is pretty standard. All of these guys take the policies uh, as given in choosing their problems. Now, given any arbitrary tax system of this kind, uh, any arbitrary tax system induces wedges between marginal rates of substitution and marginal rates of transformation. In the previous formulation that I showed you with lump sum taxes, these of course disappeared, now they show up. So the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and, and leisure is distorted from the marginal rate of transformation by taxes on consumption and taxes on labor income. Similarly, so uh, the intertemporal marginal rate of substitution is distorted by uh, possibly varying, time varying consumption taxes. S the the uh, tariffs on, on, on trade in, uh, introduce wedges between uh, the marginal rate of substitution and intermediate goods at home and abroad uh, by these tariff terms. These tariffs also uh, introduce uh, wedges between intertemporal marginal rates of substitution uh, in the dynamic production efficiency sense. So let me turn to an important theorem. So I'm going to use what's called the primal approach here. Um, if you try to, so, so my task is essentially to find the best competitive equilibrium, the least distorting competitive equilibrium, that's, in principle, a hard problem. The, the, the so-called dual approach uh, fall, essentially follows the following algorithm. Specify some tax system. Look at the induced competitive equilibrium. Vary the tax system. Compute the new induced competitive equilibrium. And keep doing that up until you end up on the Pareto frontier. Um, computationally, as you might imagine, this is a nasty problem because you've got to solve a whole bunch of fixed point problems along the way. For each tax system, you've got to figure out what the competitive equilibrium is. That can be a pretty nasty problem. Uh, Bob Lucas and Nancy Stokey innovated, and I've sort of uh, used this extensively, and I've made my own innovations to it, I guess. Um, I'm going to try and, uh, and simplify this problem so that I can describe the problem of finding the best cooperative equilibrium as solving a programming problem. Programming problems, of course, are, are substantially easier to solve than fixed point problems. And so it's very convenient to do that. So as a way of showing you how uh, uh, I can do that, what I'm going to argue is a, a bunch of things. First, I'm going to define this notion of an implementability constraint. Where does this come from? It's actually pretty straightforward. You just take the household's budget constraint in present value form, right? Use the uh, optimality conditions, the first order conditions, substitute that, and what you end up it, with is that any competitive equilibrium, as I'll show you, argue in a minute, must satisfy the so-called implementability constraint, which essentially says the present discounted value. This is sometimes called the excess burden of taxation. Um, that word helps some people, other, leaves other people confused. Um, but just think about this as an algebraic uh, expression. We just, say, we just uh, relates the marginal utility of consumption, the level of consumption, similarly to so the marginal disutility of, of work. 
times the amount of work, and that must be equal to the value of initial wealth. The value of initial wealth is given by this expression in marginal utility terms. That's the tax on initial wealth. That's the tax on initial consumption. This is, in physical units, the value of initial wealth, which includes the return to capital plus the value of any initially outstanding government debt and the value of any foreign claims that these countries uh, uh, must, uh, must hold. Okay, so this is the cool proposition, which simplifies the problem dramatically. And it has two parts. Give me any allocation, which is just the vector of consumption, labor, and intermediate goods, and some period zero policies. Those objects must satisfy, and you can see that they obviously must satisfy the resource constraint and the balance of payments condition, and they must satisfy the implementability constraint, because we just derived it from the household's budget constraint and household optimality. Um, um, but there's a, and so, in some sense, those are necessary conditions. Interesting thing is, it turns out that they're sufficient also in the following sense. Give me any allocation and period zero policies that satisfy the implementability constraint, the resource constraints, and the balance of payments condition. Then there is a set of policies. So this is the entire sequence of, 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 of taxes and, and, and a whole bunch of prices at each date, which, uh, it, which are in turn a competitive act. All right, so this is not a statement about, about optimal uh, uh, competitive equilibria or Ramsey equilibria or anything like that. It's only a statement about the set of competitive equilibria. All right, okay, so this is a complete characterization of the set of competitive equilibria. Any competitive equilibrium is equivalent to uh, these three uh, conditions. So um, I'm going to focus on cooperative Ramsey equilibria where country one gets some weight lambda, country two gets some weight one minus lambda. And so a Ramsey equilibrium is the best competitive equilibrium. So clearly, a best comp the best competitive equilibrium must maximize this programming problem over the implementable set. So now we've simplified the problem of trying to determine the Ramsey equilibrium into a pretty straightforward uh, uh, programming problem. And I'm going to impose restrictions on, uh, on the value of initial wealth, which I referred to earlier. I'm going to say that there's some exogenously give, given value of initial wealth, which, the, um, uh, which this must satisfy. An interesting sidelight side to this, this way of setting up the problem is that the problem becomes uh, recursive and therefore easy to compute uh, 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 using re standard recursive methods. Uh, and the cool thing about that is, uh, Debraj might find this kind of interesting, is that if I considered a game where uh, the government in each period does not choose policies. So far, I've looked at situations where this cooperative planner, in some sense, is choosing policies over the infinite horizon. You don't need to do that. If, you, if instead uh, I considered policymakers who, consider, who choose policies for today and choose a level of promised wealth tomorrow, then tomorrow's policymaker, faced with the same situation, is going to choose a bunch of, uh, of policies and so on. So the whole infinite continuation of all that is, in fact, a Markov equilibrium of that of that particular game, if you will, among planners in, in each period. Uh, so you can, you can implement that. At, you can implement the Ramsey equilibrium in that recursive fashion. It's useful uh, uh, computationally. But I won't talk about that. So let me tell you what our principal results are. Uh, this is sort of, it's a little bit cheating to call it analog of the sec second welfare theorem because I don't have decentralized interaction between governments, but I do have decentralized interaction among private agents. So uh, this is the analog. 
the, the analog is that you fix any uh, social welfare weights. There exists some set of transfers such that the Ramsey allocation satisfies dynamic and, and static production efficiency. What that means is that there's one implementation. Remember, if you remember, the static and dynamic production efficiency conditions were distorted by tariffs. So what this says is there's one implementation of a Ramsey equilibrium, which taxes only consumption, labor income, and initial wealth, imposes no uh, uh, tariffs or taxes, on imports and exports, which implements the Ramsey equilibrium. And so in that sense, uh, free trade is optimal, um, both in a static sense and in an intertemporal sense. So in that sense, free capital mobility is optimal. So you should, the way I've set this, this, this problem up, I've not assumed that international capital markets are integrated. That is something that is a matter left for policy. Policy can distort the extent of integration in international capital markets. What this theorem is saying is, no, you want integrated capital markets uh, in the Ramsey equilibrium. You want static free trade uh, in goods and services. The tax rates on consumption and labor income in general are not uh, the same across all of these countries. That depends on the details of preferences and on, uh, on the, the size of the welfare weight that the planner assigns to these countries. All right, so, so depending on both of those, uh, you can tax har harmonization in that sense is not, not optimal. And as I said, it allows for uh, free capital mobility uh, also. Um, uh, one thing that I should emphasize in all this, which I did not, uh, but this proposition is, in some sense, independent of the details of the technology set, as long as the technology set is a convex coin. That's the only restriction I need in this. So the same theorem applies in any situation where the technology set is a convex cone. It excludes certain kinds of models, like the mallets hoppenheim type models with monopolistic competition and stuff like that. There you need, because of monopoly power, you need, may need offsetting uh, subsidies or taxes and so on uh, and so forth. But any environment in which I don't have any monopoly power uh, at the level of producers, uh, so that I'm modeling producers as, as behaving competitively and I've got uh, appropriate convexity assumptions on the technology set, the theorem applies. So the theorem applies well beyond the particular uh, bacchus kehoe kidlin model that uh, I laid out. That's just for concreteness uh, for some of the analysis. All right. So that's sort of the big theorem. Here are a bunch of formulas, uh, which I don't expect you to get anything out of, uh, ex except to note that uh, these, these things over here are own and cross elasticities uh, of uh, marginal utility. And so this is where the Ramsey insight about elasticities and so on uh, playing an important role in the design of the tax system uh, uh, play an important role. All I want to emphasize is that there are no wedges in static production efficiency, and there are no wedges in intertemporal uh, production efficiency. But in general, uh, uh, the static uh, relationship between marginal rate of substitution, consumption, and labor, and the marginal rate of substitution is going to be distorted by details about own and cross elasticities. And similarly so, the intertemporal efficiency is going to be dis distorted by, uh, by those objects. Yes? Yes. Right, so there are two, there are, 
It's a very good question. So Atkinson and Stiglitz uh, analyzed two particular uh, types of economies. In one economy, in, in one setup, they looked at Ramsey taxation. And there, their theorem was that a theorem about uniform commodity taxation. If any subset of goods has, um, if preferences are homothetic over some subset of consumption goods and separable from other goods, then uniform commodity taxation is, is optimal. Uh, and of course, that theorem applies here. In this intertemporal context, what, this, what that means is the analog of that is, let me go all the way back to preferences. The analog of that theorem is if the utility function is separable over time in consumption, and the utility over consumption has the isoelastic form, sometimes people call that constant uh, relative risk aversion. That's sort of misleading in this deterministic framework. Constant intertemporal elasticity of substitution is technically the right statement. If preferences have that form, then uh, uniform taxation of, of consumption is optimal, so you need only to tax labor income. Uh, so that actually is something that uh, you can, if you are unusually astute and good at doing algebra, it turns out that there are no cross elasticities, so this term goes away, and these things are constant over time. So it comes out of that. Uh, I have what I think of as a much more elegant proof of that, uh, of that proposition by reinterpreting the consumption at each date as an intermediate good that goes into a single final good, and the, and the details of that are in the companion paper with uh, Nicolini and Tellis. Uh, so yes, uh, not surprisingly, uh, the Atkinson-Stiglitz result continues to hold. Let me turn now to uh, a second uh, theorem. This, I think of this as the analog of the first welfare theorem. So the, the, the second welfare theorem in this context is, you tell me any lambda, I can get you the right set of transfers across countries, governments in countries, uh, so that you don't want to distort uh, static or dynamic production efficiency. The analog of the first welfare theorem is that there is, for, there is some lambda such that transfers are in fact zero in the Ramsey equilibrium. You don't need to make any transfers. There exists some allocation such that you cannot improve on, on that allocation in a Pareto sense. All right? There exists some weight such that you can't improve on that. And one way of thinking about this is think about the utility possibility set with transfers. This is the present discounted valid utility of the representative household in each country. You get some, some set. This is the utility possibility set. And then B is mislabeled. That's another typo, but I'll tell you what all this is. The, the, the spirit of this theorem is that there's some point on this Pareto frontier such that if you were not allowed to make any transfers, you get, you get, a, you get a utility possibility set which is obviously uh, uh, inside uh, the, the utility possibility set with transfers. The, the, what the theorem sa is, says is that there's some point such that these two sets touch, they coincide. So you can't improve on this. So if you start from this allocation, here, you can't improve on it. So uh, the middle frontier is no transfers. Trying to raise taxes. Yeah, no transfers across governments. No transfers across and what's in the outer one, there are no, there are no uh, revenue demands. No, no, no. The outer one, there are still revenue demands. It's just that in period zero, the governments can make a one lump sum transfers to each other, only the governments. The, 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 the private agents are not involved in that transaction, all right? Uh, it may affect prices and so on, but, but these are just government to government transfers. So in, in the inner set, the inner uh, set consists of the set of feasible utilities that you can get to when you don't allow period zero transfers. 
and the outer one when you allow period zero transfers. No, the wedges don't vanish. There are wedges. It turns out that the wedges in this economy where you're not allowed to, to make transfers are the same as the wedges in the economy with transfers. In both economies are exactly the same. Um, so um, A is the analog, as I said, of the first welfare theorem. This is simply the assertion that a competitive equilibrium is, in fact, efficient. Um, uh, now, B, uh, I, C is given welfare weights, the planner may, may choose to implement, depending upon what his welfare weights are, may choose to implement a point like C. And B should actually bet be between C and A. It should be somewhere here. I've mislabeled it. I apologize for that. Uh, and so that says, uh, if I'm allowed to make transfers, what point do I? Um, all right, so um, if I don't have any transfers, all right, so, the, so what's the proof of this, of this theorem? If it's, it's the usual mantel Nagishi argument applied now to an economy with distorting taxes. So if you remember the standard mantel Nagishi argument for trying to find, find the, um, uh, find the transfers that implement uh, for, for showing that, basically for proving the first welfare theorem, is um, I maximize uh, some weighted average of utility subject to the implementability set and the resource constraint. And then I vary, as I vary lambda, I try and find some point at which what's called excess savings is zero. All right? And excess savings in this context is simply the present discounted value of, uh, of, of net exports. And while Ra's law implies that the sum of excess savings has got to be zero, and so the Nagishi argument, which uses the Brouwer fixed point theorem, I'm cheating a little bit here. There are two countries here, so therefore I could just as well apply the intermediate value theorem. Uh, but but you got to remember, Brouwer is at some not some level. Brouwer is literally the extension of the intermediate value theorem to our end. And so that's all I'm doing, just to illustrate that the same argument applies, even if I have n countries. So you define a map from the unit simplex to the unit simplex in this clever Nagishi form, apply Brouwer's fixed point theorem, and that, and that tells you that there exists Pareto weight such that free trade is optimal. It's just the intermediate value. want to make transfers to this country. Exactly. And then there's some value of lambda in between such that you don't make any transfers. But why can't there be historical claims that even if lambda is zero, the transfers are still going to the lambda equal to zero? That, that's possible. This, uh, it, it, it's, it's possible. So therefore, what, what, what we assume is that those historical claims, up to apply this theorem, we assume historical claims are zero. But the theorem also applies for historical claims. Very good point. Uh, so I haven't told you all the sufficient conditions that I've assumed, but the simplest one is historical claims are zero. Uh, that's a very good question. All right. Let me turn now to, how much time do I have? I have another 20 minutes, right? 13 minutes, okay. Uh, 10 minutes, all right. Okay, I should, I should get uh, uh, moving on this. I want to turn to one issue which shows up all the time. India has, has just implemented its own unique version of value-added taxes, as all of you know. Uh, we have to be different from everybody else, and so we've chosen to have a, a system which has an unbelievable variety of value-added taxes differentiated by commodity, scale, uh, and so on and, and so forth. And not only that one that is changed pretty much, Chetan tells me every hour, but I think he's exaggerating. Roughly every month we change it. It allows for lots of excitement and political discussion, which we love. Uh, and so I'm going to look at uh, implementing this efficient allocation through a different tax system, which consists only of value-added taxes 
and labor income taxes and allows for border adjustment. So border adjustment has no taxes on exports, cannot deduct imports. This system turns out to be equivalent to a consumption tax and a labor income tax, which I've already argued implements the efficient outcomes. So in fact, not surprisingly, this system can implement the efficient outcomes. Uh, and just to give you some detail on this stuff, all of this stuff shows up here. This is the present discounted value of an intermediate goods producer, which produces software for sale in India, software for sale in the US, and it pays value-added taxes. On what? Only on domestic sales, sales to other domestic firms. It's, it, it, the base does not include Tau, tau 1 TV is the value-added tax in period T uh, in country 1. It's not a, it, it, the, the revenues from sales to the United States are not included uh, in, this, in this base. Similarly, so as far as the final good firm is concerned, uh, purchases of airplanes from the United States are not, in, are not deductible from your value added tax. All right, so that's the sense in which border adjustment affects the base on which you get taxed. The proposition in the paper is that the value added tax is equivalent to a consumption tax and so therefore yields efficient outcomes. When I turn to value added tax systems without border adjustment, now life gets more complicated. Now I'm going to allow for tariffs. Earlier on I didn't because I didn't need them. Here it'll turn out that I do need them. So I do need tariffs levied by country J on imports from country I. And so therefore the intermediate goods firm now pays a value added tax both on domestic sales and on sales abroad adjusted by the, the tariff on exports. And similarly, so the final good firm gets to deduct purchases of airplanes from the United States, but uh, has to pay an import tariff as well. So the first order conditions in this case imply, not surprisingly, that the tariffs, if they're there, are going to interfere with static production efficiency. And furthermore, if the, the value added taxes are time varying, then um, value added taxes and the tariffs are going to interfere with dynamic production efficiency. The relevant proposition is that if you set these tariffs to zero, all of these objects, but the optimal allocation in that situation has time varying consumption taxes, or in this context, time varying value added taxes, you are going to screw up dynamic production efficiency. And so therefore, if you want to implement the efficient outcomes without border adjustment, you necessarily need tariffs. They have to be set in such a fashion as to offset the static production efficiency effects exactly and set in such a fashion as to offset these intertemporal distortions that are introduced by value added taxes. So in general, if you insisted on free trade, you cannot implement the Ramsey equilibrium. This is again this proposition that I was talking about, about multiple ways of implementing efficient outcomes. You can implement efficient outcomes with no bar, uh, with border, without border adjustment, but to do so, you will necessarily have to impose tariffs. All right, that's, that's the, the content uh, of this uh, proposition. How do I think about these time varying stuff? I've written down a, a deterministic model just to make the exposition clear. All the arguments that I'm making extend immediately to a stochastic model as long as markets are complete. And so in that context, what it essentially says is, if there are stochastic shocks which induce variations, even in some sense in a stationary equilibrium, which induce variations in desired consumption taxes, uh, you can't implement the Ramsey equilibrium uh, without border adjustment. So the Ramsey allocations are implementable with border adjustment. They're not implementable. Um, but there's a theorem going back to Abba Lerner that says this is, these should be equivalent. What exactly is going on? Um, so 
Abba Lerner's theorem, it's called the Lerner symmetry theorem, is a straightforward theorem which follows from elementary price theory. Taxes on imports are equivalent with, to taxes on exports. Why? Because with one import good and one export good, which is the case considered by, by Lerner, only the relative price between these matters. And so therefore, whether you screw around with the numerator or the denominator is in some sense uh, irrelevant. Where does the Lerner symmetry theorem fail? It fails if you have multiple import goods and multiple export goods, each of these with different tax rates. Now you can no longer show that one is equivalent to another. The simplest way of thinking about this is imagine that a country is only uh, uh, importing goods and not exporting anything and it has a, enough of an asset position to finance this. Now import, impose export tariffs, uh, it has no effect on revenues. And so that kind of difficulty is what uh, creates problems. Uh, such a tax change alters all this. And the key thing, this is something, I think, this is a, I think of this as the central contribution of general, of, of, of general equilibrium theory from Arrow de Brew and earlier, uh, John Hicks and Irving Fisher. You can always take a dynamic model with, with complete markets and interpret it as a static model with multiple goods. One in, you can index goods by time or by place and, and so on. And so therefore, in a dynamic model, if you have different tax rates on these different commodities, then learner symmetry fails. And, uh, and uh, uh, with having border adjustment or no border adjustments turns out to matter. All right? And I think about free trade as a useful uh, benchmark for a bunch of reasons, as a lot of people in, in the political economy of international trade have argued. One important reason to engage in international trade agreements is to protect yourself against domestic lobbies. Right? You just blame the other country and say, I don't know, I can't do it. WTO doesn't allow me to impose a protective tariff on you. Uh, the shoe manufacturer comes to you and says, we're struggling. If you want to, uh, us to vote for you, you've got import, imposed tariffs. And you throw up your hands. I, uh, Mankiw had a nice way of describing this. International trade agreements take the form I promise not to shoot myself in the foot if you promise not to shoot yourself in your foot. Uh, right? That's the nature of most trade agreements. Uh, they, they help solve a lot of domestic political economy problems. So I think that free trade is, in that sense, uh, uh, desirable. And the content of what we've tried to do is to show that. I'll skip over uh, a bunch of details that are in the paper. Let me briefly talk about uh, Murley's taxation. And then um, uh, I can conclude. I'll be done uh, for that. So, so far, I've taken the tax system as given. Um, what Jim Murley's did was to ask a more primitive, what we would call um, in modern parlance, um, solve a mechanism design problem, where the instruments are not given, but the instruments are constrained by informational restrictions. Uh, that are, are taken as a given. Uh, and so here's a brief illustration of a Murley's type argument in this context. Uh, I want to think about there being a continuum of households in each country. And uh, each household in each country is indexed by a parameter. This parameter will turn out to correspond to some notion of productivity or heterogeneity in preferences, as will become clear. Um, so formally, I think of each household as supplying, this is the amount of disutility, if you will, that they get from supplying labor. That's the effective units of labor. So a household with a theta that's twice as large supplies twice as many units of, uh, of effective labor and there's uh, some distribution of these types theta. Uh, and this is where the informational stuff comes in. The, the cooperative planner, what can the cooperative planner observe? The cooperative planner can observe consumption at each date uh, by uh, uh, each type of household and can observe the effective units of labor of each type. 
does not observe theta. So this theta is theta i k is private information to the household. All right. Okay. So one interpretation of this is that leisure in the in the workplace and leisure at home are perfect substitutes. So you, you hire somebody to sit in front of a computer and write some number of software code. You can, you can observe, what you can observe is the number of units of software code that the, that the person produces. What you cannot observe is even if he or she shows up for 40 hours a week, you can't tell whether the person worked 20, 25, and so on and so forth. Can own because the rest of the time he or she is playing video games. All right, okay, on the computer. And you can't tell whether the guy's playing video games or is writing code. All right, okay, so that's the that's one interpretation of what all this means. All right? So the important assumption is theta is private information, but L and C are observable. So um, what's a mechanism here? Uh, this is Meyerson's revelation principle applied in this context. So you can think about this as setting up some complicated uh, nonlinear tax system. Or Meyerson's revelation principle essentially says any arbitrary mechanism can be implemented weakly by the, by, uh, the truth-telling equilibrium of a revelation game. The way I think about a revelation game, and I think the way Roger thought about it, is that each one of us reports our type confidentially to a computer. The computer then spits out allocations in a hidden action environment, spits out recommended effort, and so on and so forth. And it, has, it is a truth-telling equilibrium. That's the, that's the content of the theorem. And so therefore, in, uh, what that means is that any allocation must satisfy so-called incentive compatibility constraints. The incentive compatibility constraints essentially say that your payoff from reporting your type truthfully is at least as large as your payoff from reporting uh, some other type theta hat, given that your true type is theta. This illustrates one important thing which people miss sometimes, which I think I should emphasize, which is I could interpret this theta either as heterogeneity in productivity in, in the ways I've described, or you can interpret this as heterogeneity in preferences. That is that this person's preferences are given by this object, and theta is, is, an, uh, 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 is, is not known, and then households uh, rank allocations in this, in this fashion. So, a cooperative Murley's outcome is an allocation which maximizes uh, some Pareto problem where J1 and J2 are the planner's weights. So I'm allowing for redistributive motives either from people who will turn out to be rich in equilibrium, uh, away from people who will turn out to be rich in equilibrium, or alternatively if you wanted people uh, transfers to people who are going to be rich in equilibrium. So those are the welfare weights that the planner assigns to the different theta types, subject incentive compatibility and resource uh, uh, feasibility. What's the proposition? The proposition is again the analog of what we showed earlier. So once I allow for nonlinear taxes, that's one interpretation of this setup, and have those nonlinear taxes come from restrictions on, on information, what, what other agents, and in particular the planner, can observe about each person's type, you still get production efficiency so that free trade and unrestricted uh, capital mobility are optimal. Let's go, now I can come back to Nicola's question about the second part of Atkinson and Stiglitz, where, in effect, they considered an environment like this and showed that uh, so now you're able to in the Ramsey setup you need homotheticity and and separability in the Murley setup you can dispense now with homotheticity all you need is separability uh, then it's optimal to have uh, no intertemporal distortions um, and again there's the original algebra oriented proof in, uh, in the original Atkinson Stiglitz, which one can reproduce, or, or uh, the proof that I like a lot better, uh, because it's much more elegant, is a proof due to, uh, due to Golosov, 
Roger Lakota and Chavinsky uh, in their analysis of Merley's taxation and dynamic models. They have a very elegant proof, uh, which is reproduced again in the paper, and at least in the companion paper uh, to this one. Okay, so summary, production efficiency is optimal in Ramsey and Merleysian environments with widely used taxes. Uh, border tax adjustments are desirable. Uh, so the public finance guys got it right. And I, I skipped over this in the interest of time, um, but you can see it in the paper. Something that looks like residence-based taxation or destination-based taxation rather than source-based taxation uh, is, is optimal, at least from a cooperative uh, standpoint. Um, there is a literature stemming from an interesting paper by Naito, uh, which, um, which argues, which looks at a particular environment and shows the production efficiency is optimal. I have a companion paper with, uh, with a bunch of students at Minnesota uh, um, arguing that private information by itself doesn't do it, but once you allow for what, what we call hidden trading, what the literature calls hidden trading, then you may want to distort uh, production efficiency. So that's just by way of advertising forthcoming attractions. But please don't, don't remind Brian and Adwai and Kayvon about this because they've been bugging me to finish the paper and I'm just a lazy person who hasn't uh, gotten around to, uh, uh, to writing up the theorems that they proved. So let me stop right there and be happy to entertain questions. Uh, thank you for the thank you for the presentation. We're living in a polluted city, uh, and I assume this means there are substantial externalities present. Am I correct in assuming that those have been ruled out, consumption and production externalities, for all the presentation you've given us? And is that really not serious in a world faced by global warming? Sure. No, I think I think those are very really important questions. One thing I should say is that. The framework does allow for public goods, uh, local or global public goods, uh, and all the results go through as long as those public goods show up in preferences uh, in an additive uh, kind of fashion. So it explicitly allows for public goods. Uh, it does not, I do not uh, consider uh, externalities that affect the technology set all right, or affect, affect preferences in a non-separable kind of fashion. Uh, and it's, I think, standard in public finance that once you have those kinds of externalities, then you do want to have Pigovian taxation. And it's actually a very interesting question of Adwai Day, whom I referenced earlier, who actually um, did his uh, master's work, I believe, at Delhi School, um, and then is a student of mine at Minnesota, he's on the market this year, specifically thinks about Pigovian taxation in the context of an economic model of climate change. And he points out something which has been thoroughly ignored in the literature, that the nature of those Pigovian taxes uh, is something that corrects problems with, in some sense, static production decisions, but also involves introducing an intertemporal wedge in capital accumulation decisions. So yes, the moment you have those, then you need to do this. The point of this paper was to say, was to say something slightly different. I take as given that we will need a, a Pigouvian ta tax system to correct externalities. Uh, uh, as far as public goods are, and, and, and public goods provision, to the extent that they interact with production decisions or consumption decisions, that's absolute. I just take that as given. The, I'm asking a narrow question for redistributive reasons or to provide for, uh, for uh, government consumption. Do you need to add additional distortion? above and beyond whatever corrective instruments come from the Peruvian tax system. And the point of this analysis is those considerations alone do not dictate departure from production efficiency. Um, with externalities, you actually, 
Why do you want these Pigouvian taxes? Because you want to get to production efficient allocations. And the decentralized economy without those taxes does not get you to production efficiency. So I think about all of these as pushing us in the, in the general direction that Daniel and Merleys emphasized 40 years ago, that production efficiency is a desirable aspect of efficient economies. Uh, and so that, I think, is the overall message that I'd like you to take away. Classrooms where people are sitting and watching this. So, uh, is it room 13? I mean, uh, are there any questions from room 13? Uh, it's perfectly okay not to ask questions. <laughs> room 13? T is waiting for us outside. And I'm glad to talk with any of you uh, okay. well, we have for the rest of the day. Time for maybe one or two more questions. Yeah. Thierry has a question. Thierry over here. I was thinking about something which is uh, in, the in the Merrill's type of framework, how these um, free trade uh, property, optimal property, works out when you, the, piece, the Spence Merrill's condition doesn't hold and you have bunching. In that case, I'm not sure. I mean, because in all of those models, typically you may have situations where you have non convexities on your implementable uh, set of allocations. And in that case, uh, things are more complicated. Right. So there are, there are two related kinds of questions. When, um, when, when uh, a single crossing condition doesn't hold, um, my guess, it's only a guess, is what you need to do is the stuff that that Meyerson did in his optimal auction design paper. You need to use ironing uh, in order to smooth, look at the convex hull of the distribution. Um, and some condition like that holds. There's a related pro set of problems which people are working on, which is hard, which is to think about multidimensional screening problems. With multidimensional screening problems, uh, as as Ganeri and others have, have argued, uh, the mechanism design problem itself gets horrendously complicated. And uh, it's, it's, to some extent, an open question. It's less open than you might think, because all of these problems, it's true that the objective function uh, may not be uh, convex. Where what, what, but the objective function, I'm just talking about the, the utility function and the set of incentive compatible allocations. Um, production efficiency is simply the requirement that you are at the boundary of, a, of the production set. All right, OK? So in general, even if preferences are not convex, there's going to be some supporting hyperplane. And my own guess, but again, it's a guess, is you're going to be at the boundary of production set. That's only the statement about production efficiency. Characterizing the allocations beyond that, it turns out to be a little bit of a mess. But it's certainly a hard problem. And some of you students out there should be thinking about, thinking about multidimensional screening problems just because they're hard uh, and seeing if my conjecture uh, that production efficiency will still be maintained, that you'll be at the boundary of the convex production set. It still holds. Uh, I wish I could say I know it for sure. I just have a strong guess it's true, and I'm happy to be disproved. OK, I think we'll stop there. So let's give Professor Chari a big round of applause. Just two, uh, two logistics. Uh, 